right, if you've got your Bibles, you can have them ready, but I don't have a main text. I've got like seven or eight main texts, so uh, smartphone might actually work better for you or the screen. <clears throat> so yeah, today we're going to talk about the uh, believer's baptism and why we believe it. Now, I, I said this last week, and that is with this series, Why We Believe, there are some things that are fundamental to the faith. To be a Christian, I mean, you really do have to believe the Trinity. You have to believe in justification by faith. But as we said last week, the, the topics I'm covering, there's actually some different views within the Christian community. There are people who don't believe in eternal security, who I believe are Christians, though we hold to eternal security very strongly here. And baptism would be another one of those issues where there are people who don't believe in believer's baptism. They might, they might baptize infants, but they still believe in justification by faith. And while I believe that is incorrect, there are some godly people out there who do, believe, who do believe that. Some of them are very smart. Some of the ones I've actually gleaned a lot of resources from these people. So the two views primarily held, credo-baptism, which is what we believe, which is we only baptize believers. Um, if you have any question about what you're going to hear today, you did see hopefully Baptist on the sign of the church today, which usually makes that pretty clear. Um, of our position on it. And then the other view, uh, pedo-baptism, which is baptizing children or infants, um, basically people who have not trusted Christ yet. However, while there are some godly Christians who do believe in infant baptism, I also have to have a disclaimer here too, there are some people who hold to views of baptism that aren't part of the faith. They aren't Christians. They'll teach things such as baptismal regeneration, where the baptism actually saves you. And if you believe something like that, that is actually heretical teaching. We do believe the Bible teaches justification by faith alone. So to add any kind of work to that, of course, would not be biblical salvation. This is also a very important deal, your view of baptism, both with theology, but also the implications to the local church. It affects the purity of the local assembly. It gives some people a false assurance of salvation. And some positions on baptism, as we said before, are just downright heretical. So... I want to give you a story of what believers' baptism looked like in the early church. Because today I think we've really lost some of the importance of it and, and what the cost was when people made the decision to get baptized. So, if you're living during the Roman Empire, there was a time of relative peace, the Pax Romana. So, not saying everything was perfect, but compared to how things had been before, you know, there was not a whole lot of wars going on. And if you lived within the empire, you were relatively secure. Now, there was also a relative amount of religious freedom in the Roman Empire, uh, but there was one catch to this. You were free to worship any god you wanted to, but you could not worship him exclusively. You also had to confess that Caesar was Lord. And so you could worship the gods you wanted to, but again, not exclusively. In fact, as you were walking around the Roman Empire and some of the cities, you might have known some inscriptions, and one of them said this, there is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved, save for Augustus. Sounds kind of familiar. And now there was also a group called The Way. And if you weren't a Christian yet, you were probably hearing about this group called The Way. And that there was rumors that they were teaching and preaching about another king. Uh, you might have heard that one of their leaders, Peter, actually said something very pointed to the religious leaders. In Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, it says... Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set and not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And this next part, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved." So it's safe to say that the early Christian church was a little bit controversial because this was the exact same thing that was said about Caesar. But now they were declaring that the only name under heaven whereby a person could be saved is actually the person, Jesus Christ. In fact, don't just take my word for it. You can Google it and you can find some of the inscriptions online. Caesar was often talked about as very messianic in terms, even called the son of God sometimes or called the savior. He looked at himself as the Savior. They, a lot of them did, and not just one, but throughout the line of the Caesars, or the Caesars. So to make this decision to get baptized, it was dangerous. You would have heard perhaps a preacher 
And you would have gone and gathered around the crowds and he was teaching how there was another king and he was the true king, the king of kings, and that he was crucified by sinners and that we are all sinners deserving of death in a place called hell, but that this king lived a perfect life, fulfilled all righteousness. He died on the cross to pay for our sins and he rose again three days later and then he would command that people would believe on this king and that they should come and be baptized as a public proclamation of their faith that Jesus is the true king, that you put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah in direct conflict with Rome and their pagan gods. So now when we talk about this idea of baptism and what the cost was, you can see why Jesus sometimes would say that to become a disciple, first count the cost. We talk about baptism that when people would do it, that they could lose their jobs, sometimes their lives, sometimes their lands, their family. I hope this makes sense now. To be baptized is almost making you, and sometimes it was, an enemy of the state. You were going against the empire. So with that being said, I want you to think about how important baptism was to the early church. As I'm explaining this, because what is sad to me is when we talk about baptism today, for a lot of people, it's just like, you know, meh. Just one of those ordinances. It's something they do in the church. It's just a ceremony. It's far more than that. So, baptism background. Um, baptism wasn't necessarily a new thing that actually just started with Christians. Now, of course, there's a difference between Christian baptisms, but the idea of being immersed or ceremonial washings has existed for a very long time. So when they saw John baptizing people for the baptism of repentance, they weren't like, hey, what's this new thing this dude's doing? Dunking people underwater. This is something they had probably heard of before or seen before for different reasons. In fact, you can even go into the Old Testament in Leviticus, and they talk about ceremonial washings. That takes us, though, to what is the baptism meaning? Well, if I'm going in with the definition of baptism, baptism isn't actually an English word. It's transliterated. Essentially, they took it from the Greek, and they used the English alphabet, and now it's like a Greek-English word. And so, the words you would have seen used as baptized sometimes, want to be bapto, want to be baptizo, and if you look at an English dictionary and you're trying to get clarification on what, what is baptism, you'll, you'll pull up the English dictionary, and you know what it's not going to tell you? The definition of baptism. It's going to give you different methods based on what different people believe about it. Like, well, so, you know, could be sprinkling, could be pouring, could be dunking, could be dipping. But what does the Greek word mean? It actually means to immerse. And this isn't just something that we're saying because we're Baptists and we're biased on the meaning. You can actually see this in extra-biblical Greek literature. This was not a hit in the first service, but did any of you guys, please, did any of you guys watch Forged in Fire? All right, well, a couple. So, two strikes. Anyway, Forged in Fire is a TV show where, you know, you get some specs about a blade you have to make, and you make this blade, and you've got three blacksmiths, and one of the things that's really critical that they have to do is they have to temper the blade. They, they quench the sword. They quench the knife. And that idea is actually... It's very historical. People are making blades all the time. Well, what word did they use? Baptizo. They weren't sprinkling their blades. They weren't dumping water over their blades. They were actually quenching their blades. It had to go into the water. Another word, the word bapto that we see that's used in the Bible is also used in extra Greek literature for the idea of like dipping clothes if you were dyeing something. So some people will try to make an idea. Well, we don't really want to talk about what baptism means in English because that's controversial. It's actually not. The word, the definition of baptism is actually pretty clear. There's not really a whole lot of dispute about that. But what does the Bible say that baptism means? Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The meaning of baptism, and I'm going to be getting into this a little bit later, is very, very closely tied to our salvation. It is a picture of what took place on the inside of our lives when we had saving faith, the Holy Spirit of God working, and we make the decision to put our faith and trust in Christ. We die to the old life, and we are alive to the new life to live 
for Jesus Christ. We have that resurrection power now inside of us where we are now followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, so closely tied to the idea of salvation and baptism when Paul is talking to the church here when they were asking, okay, um, so shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Paul says, God forbid. And he points to the meaning of baptism so they can reflect on their salvation. How would you do this? Remember your baptism, how, how you reflect upon it. It meant that you died to the old way of life. You had faith in Christ and you, you in a sense, spiritually rose again with Christ. So baptism is a picture of what happened to us at the point of salvation. Well, this brings us to how were people baptized? Well, historically, if you're going to look at church history, this is all over the place. You've got people who were baptized backward, people who were back for, baptized forward, people who were dropped straight down. You've got people who were sprinkled. You had water that was dumped on top of people, which is why I also have to make a disclaimer. While I think it's valuable to look at church history for how things were done, it's also important to realize, I think, what John MacArthur said is that church history is not a hermeneutic. Uh, what he was trying to get at is it's not wise to use history and elevate it to the same level as what we read in Scripture. A couple things with this. Because when you're reading through church history, what people— won't do when they're arguing their case from church history is acknowledge the fact that the early church fathers were all over the place. So yeah, I could pretty much make any case I wanted to from an early church father, but then not acknowledge what everyone else was saying. So it's a little bit dangerous to come to conclusions based on what people in the past believed because they didn't all believe the same thing. Now, a lot of them had the same fundamentals of faith. They believed in justification of faith by that, but especially in the area of baptism, you'll notice that there wasn't exactly a, a huge consensus when you're starting to read for the first, like, six, seven hundred years. But there is some stuff we can look at where things get kind of interesting. One is known as the Didache. That is a writing that was found within the first 200 years after the time of Christ. Because one of the things about baptism we don't have in the Bible is we don't have a book of baptisms. There wasn't necessarily an instruction guide that says, okay, step one is to do this, step two is to do this, step three is to do this. Now, thankfully, we do have multiple patterns of how people were baptized, but there wasn't necessarily like an instruction manual that was given out. So this was actually, again, not Bible, not authoritative as the Bible, but something that was used as an instruction guide within the first 200 years after the time of Christ. And it says, the procedure for baptizing is as follows. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. If no running water is available, immerse in ordinary water. This should be cold if possible, otherwise warm. We're completely backward on that today. Like most of us are thinking, okay, where's the heater in the baptistry? They were back completely opposite on this. It says, if neither is practical, then pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Both baptizer and baptized ought to fast before the baptism as well as any others who can do so. But the candidate himself should not be told, or but should be told to keep a fast for a day or two beforehand. Now, Ashley and I were joking about this as we were reading a little bit, but it, this kind of makes sense what they're saying, okay? Biblically, I would agree that we should be immersed. But there were times, and I'm not saying this was correct, if you think about it, you lived in the Middle East, water wasn't necessarily always a great resource. So sometimes people wanted to get baptized, but they weren't actually near a river or a lake. And uh, what they had at that time might have been the essential today's cow trough. Now, I'll be honest, that would be a step of faith for me for you to dunk me in there. And it might not even be deep enough to do that. And so they were saying, okay, all right, all right. We know you should be immersed. But in this situation, we can walk 400 miles to the nearest river. Hey, man, why don't we just dump this on your head three times and call it done? So I'm not saying that was biblical, but we can see some exceptions were made sometimes. And you'll read those through sources where people are like, ah— yeah, we're, yeah, we're not going to do this. We're going we're gonna to do it this way instead. Biblical? No, not necessarily. But do we see cases of this happening? Yeah, absolutely we do. Now, we also notice something that is kind of striking. In the first 200 years of church history, what you won't find are explicit examples of babies being baptized. Now, what you will see are what's talked about families being baptized. And so there are some people who will read their theology into these documents, and well, it talks about families, so that must therefore indicate infants. 
But as you're also reading these documents, you will also notice something that is, follows the pattern of Scripture. Baptism was always tied to repentance and faith. So you never actually explicitly see infants being baptized, and as we'll see pretty soon, that's not even going to make sense to baptize infants. So, more importantly than church history, and while it is interesting, what does the Bible say about baptism? Acts 8, 38-39, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And there's actually a very similar consistent pattern as we read through the Bible as far as the mode of baptism, how people were baptized. It was always near a large body of water, and you see many cases where people were going into the water and then coming up out of the water. And when we think about the meaning of baptism, this really makes a lot of sense. It's picturing our death to the old life and our resurrection to the new life, so being buried with the baptism of Christ and then being raised up again to walk in newness of life. And so that actually does make quite a bit of sense. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for me if for someone to tell me, hey, I want you to get into this pond sometimes, and we're going to go into this water together, and I'm just going to pick up some of the water, and I'm going to drop it on your head. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The example we can see in Scripture is people who have gone into the water and then out of the water. So the question then is, who was baptized? And this is where there's some real controversy that arises in the church. Who was baptized? And I, and I want to be fair, but the number of Bible verses that explicitly talk about infants being baptized. I heard an evangelist who talked about this once, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is the most charitable thing to do, but I did think it was kind of funny. He was helping at a church, and at, at this particular church, um, these people did baptize infants. And so he had a gospel tract made up. It wasn't really a gospel tract. It was an, a tract that said, what the Bible says about infant baptism. But the thing is, is when you opened it, it was blank. There was nothing on the inside. And well, that's not inaccurate. If you're looking for explicit cases where infants were baptized in the Bible, you'll find zero. There is not a single verse in the Bible that talks about infants being baptized. So we'd say, okay, great, that settles it. Well, no, not so much. Uh, this issue of been baptized, how to be baptized, has been argued now for you know, where are we at now? 1,800 years. So I, I wish just saying this would be enough to settle it, but it, of course it is not. I think what helps strengthen our position even beyond that is an understanding of what the new covenant is, who that community is made up of, and how we enter in to the new covenant. Jeremiah, verses 31 through 34 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no, no more in every man, or and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. And catch this part, it's very important. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And this next part, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Ezekiel 36, 25-27 has something very similar. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your, from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you a new heart, also will I give, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So when we're talking about the new covenant, we're talking about the New Testament. What Jesus did to accomplish our salvation. God said, hey, there was an old covenant, and there was an old law. I gave my statutes and my commands, and you failed to follow them. But now there is a new covenant... And this is the covenant that Jesus was actually going to be purchasing with his blood. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you entered into this new covenant. And he says this particular community, this new covenant community would be people who all know the Lord. This community would be a people who have all had their sins forgiven. 
And he said, it's not the same as the old covenant, the one I gave to your fathers. This is, in fact, a new covenant. In the New Testament, it is called a better covenant. So to reiterate, this is a people who all know Christ, whose sins are forgiven. They have a new heart. They have a new spirit. The heart of stone has been taken out. They have a heart of flesh. This might be, if this is sounding familiar, think of what Jesus said. You must be born again. The idea of having a new life. This is what the new covenant is. Well, why does this matter? Well, I'm bringing all of this up because one of the main groups that teaches infant baptism, and again, I don't think they're heretics, is Presbyterians. Presbyterians do believe in salvation by faith alone. So they do believe that infants are baptized and are entered into the new covenant community, but they still believe that the child does have to express faith. They have to repent of their sins and turn to Christ. And so while I don't agree with how they do baptism, I do believe that they are Christians because, well, it's justification by faith alone. I just think they have things backward. And then understanding of what these covenants are gives us a good understanding of why they're wrong and why I believe we're right. So they'll take you to Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. And it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So they'll take this verse and say, hey, see? Baptism replaces circumcision. They have a view of covenant theology that is so strong. They believe in a, a continuity between the Old and New Testament. And by the way, there is a continuity between the Old and New Testament, but there's also a lot of discontinuity between the Old and New Testament where things God specifically says has changed. For example, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. He said, this is not like the one I gave to your fathers. This is a new covenant. And what they're going to argue is, is they're going to look at the New Testament from the framework of the Old Testament, and they'll say, see, baptism is a sign of the New Covenant, and circumcision was a sign of the Old Covenant. And in the Old Covenant, as we talked about last week, there was a mixed group of people within the body, right? So even God had talked about in Deuteronomy that there was those who were circumcised of the flesh and there was those who were circumcised of the heart. Romans 9, 6 talks about how not everyone who was of Israel was actually of Israel. What he was saying was, is there was people within this community that weren't all followers of Yahweh. So there's people that came out of Egypt into Israel and there was a group of people, but they weren't all believers. And so circumcision was given as a sign of the covenant. So people in the old covenant could be a member of the community. They could be, could be a member of the nation but in their heart, they weren't truly followers of the one true God. And so circumcision was given to not just the parents, but to the children, to the servants, and to the slaves. And so what they will do then is say, well, because baptism is a replacement of circumcision, we have to follow the pattern of what we read in the Old Testament. And they'll say that... If we're going to be consistent with how things were done with the Old Testament, then we need to baptize our, our children. We need to baptize our infants. Because, yes, they'll say, well, look, you've got a church today, and there's a mixed group of believers within the church, isn't there? And while this is true, there's something very strong, very, very different from what they're saying. While we do have people in the church, yes, children especially, who we know aren't believers, we don't say that they are partakers of the new covenant. And while they might be among the body, we wouldn't say that they are officially part of the church body. They aren't believers. Remember who the new covenant members are, those whose sins have already been forgiven. Those who already know God. So it wouldn't be honest to say, and it wouldn't be honest to really compare the Old Testament with the new and say, okay, because of this continuity that we demand, you should therefore baptize infants. Well, they'll also talk about household baptisms to try to strengthen their case. One example would be Acts 16, verses 30 to 34. This is the story of the uh, Philippian jailer. It says, And I brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake in him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. <clears throat> 
he and all his, straightway, and when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And frequently you'll see passages when there is a multitude of people saved that'll talk about you and your children with baptism, or you and your household. What don't we find in these passages, though? Nothing explicitly states infants. You would actually have to read in a tradition that you have, a teaching that you have, to go to these passages and to read that infants were actually included among those who were baptized. And furthermore, to strengthen our case, in every example where someone is baptized in the, in the context of households, it's always those who either receive the word, they believed, they repented. And in this verse, it would actually get interesting because it talks about how those who were believed and were baptized, that they, uh, they, rejoiced. they rejoiced because their, their sins were forgiven. So are you telling me that we have a 10-day-old infant who was baptized and he's rejoicing? And he's dancing around the dinner table. Oh, thank God I've been saved. I've been baptized. I've been forgiven. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But if we're going to consistently read that passage, this is what you'd have to state. Because you're saying that everyone in the household was baptized. Well, everyone in the household also rejoiced. Was that the infants too? You know, definitely not. So what about what they say in Colossians 2? Is baptism a sign of the new covenant? Yeah, well, the meaning of baptism, of course it is. When you get baptized, you're showing people what's happened on the inside of your life, what's happened in your heart, how God has changed you. So it's definitely a sign of the new covenant, but it, is it the same as the sign of the old covenant? No, it, and furthermore, the circumcision that's being talked about, Colossians 2 says something very specific they seem to kind of skip over. In verse number 11, In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's not talking about a physical cir circumcision here. Remember, even in Deuteronomy, where God talks about the circumcision of the heart and the circumcision of the flesh. There's a difference between those who are truly believers and those who just have a, a sign. And because of what we know the new covenant is, for you to demonstrate that sign, you have to have had your sins already forgiven. You have to already be a believer because the circumcision of the heart is when we talk about, hey, I've been born again. I've got a new life. I've got a new heart. I'm a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, in a sense, circumcision being a picture of the covenant of the Old Testament, yeah. Baptism of the new, yes. But are the covenants the same? No. Is there a different practice? Absolutely. Because the new covenant that we fall under, it is different. It is better. It is not like the covenant, as it is said in Jeremiah 31, that was given to the fathers. So the other question then is, and it's very important, we know what new covenant believers are, but how do we enter into this community? Because this answers kind of all the other questions. How does someone become a member of the new covenant? Well, it's always through repentance and faith. And I have to say both repentance and faith because you're going to see baptism and you're going to see the order of baptism where people, it'll say, either believed and then you hear baptism or they had, they repented and then there was baptism because baptism assumes or faith assumes repentance and repentance assumes faith. When you repent, you turn from your sins and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's because, well, you've already turned from your sins. And so you'll always see the two together. But this also means there had to be some kind of mental understanding of what was being asked of you. Uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is a good example of this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So we got this passage about the Great Commission. He tells them to go and teach and baptize all nations. Well, if I'm going to teach someone, they have to have the mental capacity to understand what's being taught. And we see this a lot, even with repentance and faith. For someone to repent of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ, they have to understand what sin is and what salvation is. They have to understand what it means to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, I can't ask an infant to do this. And to enter into the new covenant community, 
I have to have repentance and faith. And to show them always being linked together in Acts 20, 20 to 21, it says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And Acts 2, 37 through 41 says, And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, and as many as of the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And I like this next part. Then they all that gladly received his word were baptized. And on the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So yes, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, but it's always an expression of faith of what's taken place on the inside of your heart. So to enter into the new covenant, to be a, a new covenant believer, it's always done through repentance and faith. And look, I'm not going to go into too much more detail. I actually encourage you to listen to a message Pastor Joel preached a, a few weeks ago on justification by faith alone. That's a, almost a, what, 40 minutes to an hour of a message that I'll have time to go through. But it'll give great clarity of what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what it means to be a, a New Testament believer. But this is also important to understand because there are some people who will teach baptismal regeneration. The idea, and the Church of Christ does this as well too, that they'll say you have to be baptized in order to become a believer. There's actually another denomination out there as well too who will teach that. Well, when you baptize your infant, that faith is actually being given to this infant. And so then they are born again. They are regenerate at the point of their baptism as an infant. And then they just have to keep on working their salvation out. But here's the thing. While I can't also, I, I, mean, I mean, we can't find any explicit cases of infants being baptized. There is nowhere in the Bible, anywhere, even close to the idea that saving faith is given to someone through an ordinance. Not even close. That is obviously a tradition that was being passed down. And honestly, it, just a very, very bad teaching. So I want to clarify something I said earlier. That baptism and salvation were always closely tied together. And remember the scenario that I gave at the beginning as far as people making that choice to trust Christ and they would be called to go up and be baptized. Well, when you're reading in scripture, you always see faith and baptism or repentance and baptism connected together. And I think an understanding of the context of how things happened historically back then and how they look today, they're a little bit different. Now, we understand that people have been saved the same way, and that is justification by faith alone. Romans tells us that it's with the heart that man believes unto righteousness. And so today, when we talk about someone's salvation experience, well, what happened perhaps a few hundred years ago is this idea of the altar call and the mourner's bench where people were called to come forward and they would pray and receive Christ as their Savior. And look, I'm not saying it's wrong to tell someone to pray to receive Christ as their Savior, because we understand that it's not the prayer that saves us, right? It's the faith. And that this prayer was an expression of the faith that we had. So if I were to ask you today to tell me about your salvation experience, your testimony, many of you would probably say, if you are a Christian, well, uh, I put my faith and trust in Christ, and you would tell me about this time that you said a prayer to receive Christ as your Savior. Now, I wouldn't go to say, well, okay, well, that's work salvation because you're trusting in a prayer. Well, if you understood that it wasn't a prayer that was saving you, no, it, it wasn't work salvation. Well, when we get to the pattern of the early church, what we don't find is that sinner's prayer. People, when they believed with their hearts unto righteousness, they were already saved. We're going to get to some passages that show this happens. But baptism wasn't scheduled out like it is today, where it might be three or four weeks later. And by the way, I'm not saying that churches are wrong for doing that. It's what we do here too. But if you were to ask an early believer about their salvation experience— they would tell you about a time where they trusted Christ and they went forward and they got baptized. That was their experience. 
They were called and they counted the cost of what it would mean to follow Jesus Christ. They believed in their heart and so it was sealed. They were saved at that point. But then as an expression of their faith, they would go, they would be baptized publicly telling people that they believe that Jesus is Lord and that he is their Savior and they put their faith in him. And they were representing how they were dying to their old life and how they were raised to walk in newness of life. And if you were to ask an early church believer, okay, tell me about the time you'd get saved, they would talk to you about their baptism. They understood that baptism wasn't what was actually saving them, but it was so closely tied together with saving faith that just like today, people will talk about the sinner's prayer, they would have talked about their baptism. No, baptism doesn't save anybody, but it is a representative sign of what took place in their hearts. And for them, salvation and baptism, yes, Baptism doesn't save, but they happen so close together. If we talked about that salvation experience, they would talk about the time that, yes, I believed in my heart, and I went forward, and I got baptized. And it's important to understand this because you're going to read some complicated passages sometime in Scripture, and it's going to look like that. Is this really teaching baptismal regeneration or people saved by baptism? Well, I want to give a, first a couple examples of where we can see people were justified by faith even before they were baptized, and I'm going to tackle one of the more problem passages that gets brought up. Acts chapter 10, verses 43 through 48. It says, And to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They answered Peter, or then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then pray they him to tarry certain days. So we have an example of Peter giving out the gospel. And even before they said a word, the Holy Spirit of God descended upon them. Because I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but even in our context today, before you said the sinner's prayer, the moment you chose in your heart to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, even before you went forward, even before you said the prayer, you were already saved. The decision was already made because it is with the heart man believes unto righteousness. So once that saving faith was there in your heart, even before you expressed it, you were saved. And you see this here, even before they had the opportunity to express their faith with believers, baptism, they believed in their heart the message that Peter had preached, the gospel, and they were born again. The Holy Spirit of God was given it to them. And we also see this with the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross hanging up there next to Jesus and what we don't see is when the thief turns in a heart of repentance towards Christ, Christ being like, well, there's a body of water over there, buddy, you better figure out a way to get down there or, man, you're hosed. That is not what we see. He turns to Christ and Christ looks at him and he tells him, today you will be with me in paradise because he had saving faith. So what's one of the common verses that gets brought up that talks about, and people will be like, oh, see, right here, this is baptismal regeneration. You have to be baptized to have your sins forgiven. One of the most prominent ones brought up is 1 Peter 3, verses 20 through 22, which says, Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were baptized by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth now save us. And they'll stop right there. See? In like figure where baptism doth now save us. So if you look at that passage, it very clearly teaches that we have to be baptized to be saved. Is that what it's saying though? No, you've got to continue reading on. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. This is talking about not the water that washes you. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the, res by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto them. So to break down this verse, he's ta Peter is talking about, okay, so the flood and the ark was a picture of salvation. They got into the ark, and when they got into the ark, they were saved from the wrath of God. In the same way, in like figure, baptism is also a picture of our salvation because we were buried with Christ. And he even makes a disclaimer. By the way, I'm not talking about the water that washes away the filth, is what he's getting at. So it's not the water that saves you. But then he says, an appeal of a 
clean conscience towards God because of the resurrection. So he makes this very clear, really, it's an awesome picture. The flood, the ark, a picture of salvation. And so is baptism, a picture of our salvation. An appeal of a clean conscience towards God because of the resurrection. He's saying it's a saving faith that saved you. But both the flood and baptism is a picture of salvation in that it shows we were being saved from wrath. <clears throat> and so I brought up these verses to show you there's some very good reasons why we believe what we believe. Another one that's, I think, very striking is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. This is Paul talking. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If baptism was so crucial to salvation, why would someone like the Apostle Paul state, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you? There was division in the church and that people were arguing about like what we do today where someone would say, I'm of this camp or I follow this great leader of the faith. And he's saying, hey, look, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except the couple family so that way you weren't saying that your loyalty was towards me. He said, God didn't call me to baptize. He called me to preach the gospel. Notice Paul himself makes a distinguishment between the gospel and baptism. Baptism never saved. So in summary... Baptism represents the inward reality of what has taken place in our lives. We die to the old self, and we have been raised with Christ. New covenant believers are those whose sins have already been forgiven. Baptism is a sign of the new covenant, but we enter this new covenant through repentance and faith. Baptism does not save us, but faith, true saving faith, is always closely tied to obedience. So I have to say this. I'm not saying it's impossible for someone not to be baptized and be a Christian. That happens. It does happen. But if you were to talk to the Apostle Paul and to early church believers, when their salvation testimony, their experience that they had was, I believed in my heart and I expressed that faith through baptism, it would be like someone saying, okay, yeah, my first act of obedience was disobedience. It really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to them. So baptism doesn't save us. Faith saves us. And obedience is a sign of saving faith. All of this would indicate something that cannot happen with an infant. This is why we believe in believer's baptism. An infant's sins aren't already forgiven. They don't understand what it means to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ to enter into this new covenant community. They can't. They can't even talk and understand words. So it wouldn't make sense to believe that infants should be baptized. So what are some takeaways from this? Well, have you been baptized? If you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, have you ever actually followed him in the waters of baptism? Perhaps some people, they didn't know that they needed to. If that's you today, can I tell you the Bible clearly tells us that we should be baptized? And can I tell you also that it will give you strong assurance sometimes of your salvation. You say, why would I say that? Because a lot of times people will talk to me, oh, I don't know if I'm saved because I don't remember if I said the sinner's prayer. Well, one, the sinner's prayer didn't save you. And in the early church, they never even said the sinner's prayer. They believed in their heart and they went forward and they got baptized. You can actually look forward in the day you got baptized and say, oh, I know baptism didn't save me. But there was a time I obviously made a decision because I followed Jesus in the waters of baptism. If you knew what it represented, that you were dying to the old life, and you put your faith in Christ so you could live a new life, you have something concrete to hold on to. Now, perhaps you're here today and you say, I've been saved in baptism. Look, baptism is something we can even look back to as an example of the power we have in the new life. Again, to clarify over and over, baptism doesn't save us. But even Paul does this in Romans 6. We talked about this when people were saying, hey, uh, should we continue to live in sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, God forbid. Hey, remember what your baptism represented, how you died with Christ and you rose again with new life. But in that same chapter, it also says to reckon yourselves now also to be dead. So there's times in our Christian life where we're not following the way that we're supposed to. 
We can look back at the day we got baptized and what it represented, that we have power to live for Jesus Christ because the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is now in your life so you can live for him. So you can look back at that time, hey, I remember when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and I remember what my baptism represents. And so I am struggling with my sin right now, but I have died to my sin. And the power of God is now living in my life so I can now live for Jesus Christ. Remember your baptism. This is not just some flippant thing. This is not just some ordinance. People died throughout for this throughout church history. Not just in the early church, but even in the Reformation, people being tied to chairs with weights on it and then kicked back into the lake because they made a decision to get baptized and they drowned because of how important it was to them because they realized that they had a new life and they wanted to publicly declare. So we have those t-shirts, the cool t-shirts. I have decided to follow Jesus. And his first commandment was baptism. So it is a matter of obedience, but it's also something we can look back and like it has real application to our lives. It is a picture of what took place in my heart. If you're not saved today and you're not a Christian, baptism represents something that God wants to do in your heart. Baptism will not save you. You can get washed all you want. <laughs> you'll be clean, but you'll still be a sinner. But if you'll honestly put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, realize that he was God in the flesh, that he fulfilled all righteousness, he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you'll repent of your sins and believe that Jesus Christ did this and put your faith solely in him and that he rose again three days later, the Bible says, with a heart man believeth unto righteousness. If you'll honestly believe this and put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you will be saved. And I would encourage you, get baptized. Why? Not because it saves you, but because it actually gives you something concrete to hold on to. If you believe, you've already been saved. Now show that faith by getting baptized.